Are you still on track to give back $4 billion worth of buybacks this year? Well, Danny and uh, Mark, good morning. Thanks uh, very much for having me on. Um, look, I think it's been another good quarter for uh, for the company. Um, we grew our oil and gas production by 3% while we drove costs down by 9% in that business. Uh, we brought on two new projects, one in the United States, one in India, uh, about 90,000 barrels a day. And we grew in our transition growth engines, as we said we would, 10% growth in uh, biofuels. We almost tripled the amount of power we're selling in our EV charging network. Um, and we increased our renewables and uh, our hydrogen pipeline. So it's been a good quarter. And it's that performance and that outlook that has given the board uh, the confidence to announce the $1.5 billion uh, buyback this morning. And as you said, importantly, also increased the dividend by 10%. And that dividend increase of 10% is uh, in part due to the fact that we've reduced our share count by 9% over the last uh, four quarters. So we can essentially keep the dividend amount the same while increasing the dividend per share. So this has been a good quarter. Uh, the company's uh, running well, and, uh, and we're very pleased. Bernard, good morning. Investors likely to be happy with that buyback amount, as you mentioned, and the increase in the dividend. Do you think that's going to be sufficient to close the valuation gap with some of your European peers or US peers? Because one of the, the issues has been, in the past, the, the disappointment on buybacks. You've now fixed that or made a big step to fix that. But there's been another comment about the lack of predictability around buybacks. And is this the start of a new era of more aggressive buybacks? Or do you think that predictability is still going to be an issue? Mark, thanks for the question. I think um, just a couple of things. On the buyback program itself, I think we're just being very consistent, to be uh, quite frank. We said at the beginning of the year, our, our distribution policy in general says that we'll return at least 60% of surplus cash to shareholders through buybacks. And then each year, we update on specifically what that year will be. This year, we've said it will be 60% that we will return as per last year. So that's uh, the steps that we've taken to date. 1.75 in the first quarter, 1.5 in the second quarter are entirely consistent with what we believe the outlook for the year will be, which means that we'll return that 60% uh, to shareholders. So that's uh, consistently what we are doing. The financial framework is unchanged. And uh, as I said, we expect to do $4 billion of buybacks at $60. And with prices above that, one can expect the buyback level to be above that, as you are seeing. In terms of valuation gaps that people speak about, not necessarily within the European companies, but uh, versus the United States, uh, it's simply a question of focus and delivery. We've got real plans to grow yeah. this company uh, materially over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, between now and 2025, uh, we intend to bring on 200,000 barrels a day of new production from uh, new oil and gas production from major projects. We're going to double our biofuels production. We're going to double our biogas production. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to grow the business and a business in our growth engines that was delivering $700 million just in the first half of this year will be delivering 3 to $4 billion by 2025 and indeed 10 to $12 billion by 2030. So right. this is a growth story. This is about execution. This is about focus. And that's what we're uh, set okay. on doing. Bernard, when it comes to the execution of your traders, you point out another exceptional quarter for gas trading, though softer than the first quarter. How much softer? What was the difference between these two quarters for your trading units? Yeah, the, the, the trading organization in, uh, in gas in particular had a, had a very good quarter, an exceptional quarter, as we uh, called it, a little bit uh, less than the first quarter, but still uh, exceptional, as we say. And uh, it's really just a characterization of a slightly lower volatility in the, in the markets in the second quarter than there was in the first quarter. What's your outlook on demand on both oil and gas, particularly coming into winter? Are there any particular regions where you're kind of worried about the, the demand strength? You know, I think um, there's a lot of talk, obviously, about concerns about the uh, the global economy. There's a lot of talk about uh, concerns about China uh, growth. In spite of all of these things, demand for oil uh, has been incredibly resilient. In fact, um, there are some reports that say oil will reach its maximum demand ever uh, this year. So we're expecting over 2 million barrels a day of growth in demand for oil uh, this year, which is very strong when you look back in history. And we expect that uh, demand growth to continue uh, into next year. And when you couple that uh, with the discipline 
um, that we're seeing from uh, OPEC plus, uh, then I think you can only uh, uh, believe that uh, while it's very difficult to predict, obviously, uh, one would have to suspect that the outlook for oil prices uh, is, is strong uh, over the coming months uh, and years driven by demand and driven by the discipline that we see from OPEC plus in natural gas. If I look in Europe, I think obviously storage levels are much better than they were uh, last this time last year. So that's uh, that's good news. Uh, but there's a lot of uncertainty and it really depends around how much demand will recover from what we saw in as a loss last winter and what the weather will be like. So um, not out of the woods yet when it comes to uh, to gas in uh, in Europe, but certainly in a better position than we were this time last year. What about industrial demand in China, Bernard? What does the read through look like for that to recover? I think in um, in China, and in many ways, what we're seeing uh, throughout the world, if I look at it through through our product lines, I think we're seeing very strong uh, gasoline and very strong uh, jet fuel uh, demand. Uh, people are traveling, people are spending on services, let's say. And then on the, the diesel end of the spectrum, which tends to be more associated with the manufacturing end of the spectrum, uh, we see that as being uh, weaker uh, than uh, people had expected. Uh, China is still growing. It's grown uh, 3% in the first half of this year, obviously well short of uh, what people would expect from China, 5 to 6%. But we do see uh, things beginning to uh, recover uh, in China. So it's really a story that we see throughout uh, the rest of the world, strong services and relatively weak uh, manufacturing. You, you got some criticism recently for winning a German offshore bid that you might have overpaid um, for bidding for these low carbon projects. And I'm curious about what kind of returns you expect in that project. And are you worried about diluting your returns by bidding such high prices for low carbon projects? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, we're, first of all, we're absolutely delighted uh, with that win. Um, it's exactly um, aligned with the strategy of the company, um, 100%. Uh, we said that we will get 6 to 8% unlevered returns uh, from the renewables part of the business, which is one part of our five transition growth engines. We fully expect to get uh, 6 to 8% uh, from uh, this win in Germany. I think just a couple of points I'd, uh, I'd make is um, – What's a little bit different maybe to other companies is we have a huge demand for green electricity in the 2030s from our own businesses in uh, Germany, from our own refineries and our decarbonization plans there. We're building out, I think, now the second largest uh, fast charging network in Germany. So we need green electricity for our charging business. We need it for our biofuels projects that we're building there. And we need it for our trading business. So we think we'll need 5 to 10 gigawatts. We think there are going to be a shortage of uh, green electricity in the 2030s. And our belief is that we can develop and build and operate uh, these wind farms, providing that uh, green electricity, those green electrons, cheaper than we can do by procuring it on the marketplace. We don't uh, need to necessarily own the assets. We want access to the electrons. We'll bring in partners. We'll farm it down over time. Uh, but we're absolutely delighted with this. It's consistent with strategy, and it's a great win for BP and for our shareholders.